the start of Enter the Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> oh, hi. Um, I'm Ollie. I'm the editor of Eurogamer. With me, I have Emma Kent, a uh, reporter on Eurogamer, and our deputy editor, Wesley in Poole. We're here to talk about how to get into games journalism. We've done this session at Res the last couple of years. We've also run a summer internship the last couple of years. And the first time I uh, met Emma was in this room this time last yeah. year. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, no. So I basically came to the session to learn about uh, games journalism, then heard about the internship, and I thought, oh, that's really cool. Um, but I knew that uh, Eurogamer had gotten kind of some criticism <laughs> a few <laughs> weeks before about uh, diversity. So I came with that question prepared. And yeah, no, I asked a question about uh, what Eurogamer is doing uh, to improve it at the panel to Ollie. And <laughs> so the answer was. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then I recorded the whole session and wrote it up as like a feature and then tweeted it and tagged everyone in it on Twitter as well, which is yeah. really cheeky, but clearly it worked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, no, it's full year. Full circle. Yeah, no, I mean it was it was a great it was a great introduction because obviously we're not if we're looking for a, somebody who's going to report news for our site, we're not looking for people who are going to someone who's going to ask soft questions. So the fact that Emma was prepared to step up, be the first person to ask a question at the Q and A, and was prepared to put a pretty tough question to me was a, was a was a pretty good uh, sign. So um, this is the this is going to be the third year that we run our internship about. Um, and it's, it's very much focused on reporting. Wes, do you want to tell us about that and why we focus on reporting in our internship? Um, yeah, so um, I think it was something that we wanted to make it a focus of from day one, really, like when we started the internship. Um, reporting is very important to us. Uh, we feel that uh, generally there's a, I mean, obviously a lot of news in the games industry, there's a lot of news reported by websites, but um, there is not a huge amount of quality reporting that goes on, and um, part of what we were looking for was a way to unearth the talent uh, in uh, in reporting, uh, in some of the sort of journalistic reporting fundamentals that uh, you don't see a huge amount of in in games journalism. Um, so, so really, the internship is is focused on that because we feel like it will. Uh, it will unearth the talent, but also it will benefit the site, right? I mean, um, we get some great work out. We've had some great work out of our interns over the last couple of years. Um, we've had some fantastic work out of Emma when Emma was an intern, and uh, subsequently we hired Emma as a reporter. Um, and we've had some great work since. And all of this sort of reporting stuff it tends to stand out. It tends to um, uh, be the kind of thing that uh, is, is valued, I guess, uh, when, when done really well. Um, and, and certainly um, what we feel is, is lacking in, in, a, in a lot of cases. So yeah, this is all about trying to, trying to do things uh, right, I guess. Um, and the internship is, is, is also a bit about you know, giving back, I suppose. Um, we're lucky enough at Eurogame to be in a position where we can uh, where we can do this, and so uh, and we think it's right, so so we're doing it. Um, so yeah, looking just for the next superstar video game reporters, um, and we can dig into what reporting means to us uh, a little later. But uh, that's essentially the setup for the internship. Um, how, how many people here are aspiring video game journalists? A fair few. And uh, uh, of those of you, would you consider like reporting as something that you're interested in, something you want to do? I'm seeing a few nods and a few hands. Yeah, like in my day when I got into games journalism, it was it was it was just not really a thing. News was just you know you you you, you reported the bare facts, you did headlines, you did press releases, and uh, everybody aspired to be to be critics, I think, to be reviewers. Or to be feature writers, and uh, it's. Uh, but these days, I, I really feel like reporting is like a really, a really key element of what makes our coverage, as Westeds, stand out. It's, uh, and that's part of being on the internet. I think it's in the days of uh, video games magazines. It's understandable that the focus was very much on reviews and on longer form stuff. But in uh, on the internet, you need uh, you need headlines too make a difference and you need to be able to tell stories in headlines, you need to be able to tell stories that other people aren't telling. And in order to 
uh, get those stories, you have to find them. You have to go out there and find them. I think that's kind of the basics of it, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, and, you know, this isn't to say that the other forms of uh, games journalism are you know, valid or are going away. They're not. But, uh, you know, the, the, the title of this session is How to Get into Games Journalism. And increasingly, I think that the way to stand out if you want to get uh, into games journalism, if you want people to notice you, if you want to increase your profile, is to do, uh, is to do reporting because uh, it isn't being done a huge amount. Uh, when it's done well, people notice. Moves the needle, as is a phrase I've heard, and it, and that it does. It moves the needle. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of people who want to review the next Halo, right? There's a huge amount of people who want to tell you how they feel about, uh, I don't know, Sekiro or something. But um, what about the uh, the story of the um, the mod, the Skyrim mod uh, that Terry Pratchett worked on? What about the story about the boy who stole Half-Life 2? What about uh, what about the story of a developer that collapsed and affected hundreds of staff? Um, I think what we're looking at now is a new drive for, for reporting that tells us stories about people that we wouldn't hear about otherwise. Um, so if you want to get into games journalism, thinking about those kinds of stories is how you'll get noticed. It, it, that's just the way it is now. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that the other forms aren't valid. I mean, we review games, right? Uh, we write about what we think about games all the time. Um, but, but if you want to stand out, I feel like that's really where, the way that people should be thinking. Emma, are you, I mean, I, I could ask, how did you get into games journalism? We kind of know that story, we've just yeah. told it. <laughs> but like, was it, was it what you expected it was going to be? Was it, was it different? No, reporting was definitely different from what I expected because I definitely yeah. had that kind of conception of it being very um, kind of PR churn, just like, yeah, this new game's coming out, this is the release date kind of thing. And there is a bit of that that you do, but there's so many kind of weird and interesting stories that you can explore. And it's also not something that is just kind of limited to people already in the industry. If you go on like Reddit or Twitter or any other kind of social media platform or forum, you can find people talking about games and what they're doing, interesting mod projects. And then what you do is you go further and you get in touch with those people. You can ask some questions about what they're doing. Maybe try out the mod for yourself, for instance. That's mm. something I do quite a lot. And that's a really good way to start kind of getting into it and getting yourself noticed. And some of those yeah, mod articles that I do get a lot of attention and it's wonderful to see uh, people's reactions when their community projects are noticed. Mm. I remember one of the, um, uh, w when we were looking at applications for the, for the internship last year, one of, the, um, one of the articles that you talked about wanting to do was uh, an article about the community drive to uh, like translate runes in God yeah, of War, yeah. in the new God of War, right? And I thought that was really interesting when I saw that. I thought that we would publish that. Um, and, ev and eventually when, uh, when you became the intern, you wrote that article for us, yeah, didn't you? Did. And we published it. Yeah. Um, and that, that article doesn't require like years of contacts or mm. it doesn't require like, you know, I, I'm exposing corruption in the games industry or you know, I'm finding out the truth behind the collapse of a developer. That is something you would notice by looking at a community for a game, uh, identified an angle, and, you know, packaged it in a, in a cool, cool way. That's, that's a really important point. I, in fact, there was a bit of a debate you might have seen on Twitter about this the other day after Kotaku. Uh, they have a fantastic reporter at Kotaku called Jason Schreier, who's often doing a lot of big industry expose type stories and he did a, a huge detailed piece of reporting on what went wrong with the development of Anthem and Kotaku's editor Stephen Totillo tweeted about uh, how reporting was a fantastic way, basically what we're saying here, reporting was a fantastic way to make journalism that starts, that stands out and that, that brings readers in and draws traffic and a lot of people felt frustrated by that because they're like how can I possibly do what Jason Schreier does and it's like well we're not expecting anybody 
at that level to, to be able to like, build the contacts that I mean, it takes many years of work in the industry to be able to deliver a story like that. There's only a handful of journalists who can do it. But that's not to say there aren't big stories out there that you can find, and communities is often where you can find them. And the barrier to entry there is actually quite low. So that's one thing we would strongly encourage you to do, is embed yourself in game communities, find out what communities are doing. It's easier to contact those people. They don't have walls of PR around them. They're often very keen to talk about the, what they're doing to, and to share it. So like, that's, a, that's a really important tip, I think. Yeah, I and mean, one thing that you said to me recently that sort of stuck with me is that um, when we were having we were talking about this after the, uh, when we were having this debate a few days ago, mm. is you said that you just didn't know that this kind of journalism went on. No, yeah. Uh, and that, I think we take it for granted, that we, yeah. so we know, uh, and, and we think like our little Twitter bubble knows. But generally, a lot of people who perhaps are thinking about getting into games journalism don't even realise that's the case. Is it, w so were you surprised when, because our internship was, I, I'd like to think it was clear that we were into reporting. Was that like, oh, that's a thing that is done, yeah, I guess. Yeah, no, for sure, definitely. I, yeah, no, I think when I came along, I was kind of like, oh, the internship sounds cool, but reporting, mm, I want to do like features or, yeah, reviews. I, that is exactly the kind of mindset I came along with. But you do get opportunities to do like features on online games and things like that. Like when a new mode comes out, you can report on that. And that is almost kind of criticism in itself. You can do that kind of thing. And a lot of the stories that I report on are really interesting and not the kind of bread and butter um, things that you would expect from that. And yeah, there's just a lack of awareness and it's a shame because you can get some intriguing stories that would otherwise just go ignored apart from maybe in a few conversations on Reddit. And you can become known for a patch. Like um, if you like, establish yourself as reporting in a certain topic or area, you can develop your profile alongside that patch, especially if it's, it becomes a hot topic, that can be really great. Or in Emma's ca case, Bowsette, <laughs> which became, <laughs> became your patch. You should be yeah. proud of that. Oh, gosh. Without you, Bowsette would be nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or... <laughs> oh, it's, it's a good thing. Um, but yeah, so you can almost, um, you can almost uh, become aligned with certain uh, hot topics in the industry that you identify with. I mean, one of the hot, hottest topics in the industry right now is uh, the way game developers uh, are treated making big budget games. Uh, the, the toll it can take, the mental health issues it can create. Um, and these, this is essentially, this is a human interest story. This is about people. And I think that is ultimately at the heart of great reporting, not just in video games, but, but all kinds of reporting. The most interesting stories are stories about people, stories we can relate to. Um, and those stories in games are everywhere. They are on Reddit, they are on social media, they're here at Res. There are developers here at Res who have gone through incredible things just to get their games out. Um, uh, the stories are everywhere, and I, I've, I've, I've often said that um, this is a fantastic time for games journalism even at a time when it feels like it might be getting more and more constrained. I actually think this, the, the, uh, the, our ability to contact and speak to, to people about how games are made and the impact it has on people is unprecedented. Like you, can, you can just message someone so easily now, uh, whereas it used to be quite, quite difficult to find out who made games in the first place. Um, so yeah, there the are opportunities everywhere. Uh, I think there was a panel here yesterday about um, an indie developer who had gone through incredible uh, uh, situation to get their uh, indie game out and sort of survived to tell the tale. Um, so yeah, fantastic, fantastic time, and uh, we're not. It's not like we're expecting the you know the f you know the fall of Bioware on day one or anything. It's not. It's not like that. Patches can be games as well and genres of games, but yeah. often these days a single game, like you could make GTA your patch, you could make Fortnite your patch, Apex Legends, and you could report solely on that game and you could find a lot of interesting angles and, and a lot of work, especially if you're plugging into communities. And that's something that I think is, has actually been true for a long time, because I was thinking about how I got into journalism, if any of that is still really relevant, because it was uh, quite a long time ago, I'm very old, and I 
came in working as a reviewer for print mags, and I think that's uh, freelance. I think that's probably a pretty tough route these days. People tend to do most of their reviewing on staff. But um, one thing I did do, and it almost ruined me, actually, because uh, as soon as I started freelancing full-time, World of Warcraft came out, and I got really into it, and I didn't do any work. But then I started writing about MMOs, and that was something that people on the staff of the mags didn't have the time to invest in. Um, and they didn't have the, the expertise necessary to like, report on the, or these hundreds of like, competitors to World of Warcraft that every publisher was rushing to release. So I, I made a little patch for myself there, and that really helped me establish myself. So I think that's something that, that's, that's still super relevant now. Wes, you got any lessons from when you got into games journalism that you think still apply? Uh, my, my route in is, is, is I, you know, I just don't think it's almost relevant anymore, you know? I don't think it's, it's helpful. Like my, my route in was just basically, uh, I contacted uh, the editor of a website and started talking and they hired me off the back of uh, what I think was just enthusiasm and uh, maybe like a, a, a bit of nose for news. Um, well, you had journalistic training as yeah. well, and that's not that's actually quite rare in games journalism, but it's, it's, it is valued by editors, right? Yeah, so, yeah, if you've got journalistic training, I think that helps us at a, at a sort of base level understand that you, you, uh, you know, you, you're, you're in the game for journalism, which is, which is great. Um, but ultimately, I think what makes us... Uh, so, let's, if we're talking about what we're after from the applications for the internship, right? Uh, the kind of stuff that takes and makes us uh, take note will be an eye for an angle. So, if we get a sense that you have an idea of what a story could be, uh, we'll definitely notice that. Uh, I mentioned the idea that Emma had with her application around God of War. Uh, you know, that stood out. If we can see that you've got some sort of um, uh, nose for it, as we say, then then that that really helps, um, and that uh, that I think will you know really make your application stand out. If you've got like it's already got ideas for what kind of articles you would like to produce, or ideas for uh, and and th and think about the headlines in an interesting way, uh, then. That's more interesting to us than than anything else. Um, I don't. Know, would you say that that was something that you were keen to do as when you were applying for the internship? Did that come through when you were going through the process? Yeah. No. I. Yeah. I think like headlines when we're talking about that is something that I still am trying to improve, and it's a skill that will probably take you a while to kind of hone, so that you can get convey a message very quickly in a way that's really engaging and stands out. Um, in terms of, yeah, no, I'd really encourage people to like look into original reporting, just because not only is it really good for making your application stand out, but it's just so rewarding. It's amazing to see like people's reactions to when you break something, even if it's just a community project, and then maybe other sites pick up on it, and it goes around, and then there's a buzz about it, and you're like, yeah, no, I found that and reported on that. And it's just the best. It's my favorite thing to do. So even just kind of beyond trying to apply for this internship, it's just really fun. And I definitely encourage you to try that as a kind of rewarding thing. Um, should we hand it over to questions? Because I think yeah. the way we could be most helpful is asking, yeah, answering definitely questions. Yeah, definitely more helpful answering questions. So, uh, yeah, Are we, how do we do it here? Do we hand around a mic or? Hi. Uh, just shoot your hand up if you've got a question and we'll get a mic to you. Yeah, down the front here. Thanks. What was it? Yeah. Thank you for the panel, guys. Is, uh, we go. I'm uh, James. I'm with Rebrick Gaming. Um, I came here armed with loads of questions, and you guys answered them all. Uh, apart from <laughs> apart from one, which is uh, you know, fair. So I know from my interactions on um, on Twitter and um, in person from other games journalists that there are being a games journalist is an intense and demanding role in like, as a job. Um, I know this is maybe more applicable to working in freelance, but also staff writers, um, due to the yeah the intense nature and the potential hostility you encounter. Is there anything 
being done as an industry and um, with you guys in particular, I guess, um, to, I guess, mitigate the mental health toll that having such a hyper-visible yet very open to criticism yeah. job because you're going to get a lot of shit for it's a, what it's a really write. good question like mental health is something we we take seriously as an employer at gamer network we certainly hope that other games journalism employers do also like as a team we're tight and we look out for each other and we support each other um we try our best to support our freelancers as well when we know that they're they're the target of that sort of thing. Um, I think freelancers are, are look, you're right, are, are particularly at risk there because they don't have the colleagues at the next desk they can turn to and go, I'm getting all of this shit on Twitter and you know, read out the replies and make a joke of it or or yeah. console each other. Like for freelancing is I've been there, I've freelanced for many years, it can be quite isolating. That was before Twitter though, so like it was a different kind of like it was going through like posts on the edge forum going, who is this guy? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's a good question. I think it's, I think it's something we are, we are trying, but we all need to try a lot harder. And it's, it is a shame as well that the environment is as harsh and is as polarized as it is. But um, God, there's so, there are so many factors behind that. You know, how Twitter is designed, you know, what's going on in world politics. You know, it's, it's way beyond the scope of this panel, but like, yeah, I, I, it's something that, it's, it's, it's on employers really, but it's also on editors. It's really important for editors to be making sure that they, they are aware when that's happening and that they're looking after particularly freelancers when it's happening. They're just talking to them. You just need to talk to each other. That's the most important thing, just to acknowledge that it's happening so that you can, you can exchange you can talk about it in private with somebody else who knows the process, knows what you're talking about. But um, I think it's a great question. Like yeah. putting yourself out there with an opinion in game journalism is uh, is scary, um, it, and it and it can be a very intimidating space, right? Uh, even reviewing a game now can feel like a dangerous act, uh, and it it feels like it's more uh, intimidating now than ever before. Uh, for, for, as Ollie said, lots of complex reasons. Um, I feel like at Eurogamer we're, pr we're a pretty close-knit group and we do look after each other and we are mindful of each other's well-being. I like to think we ask each other questions when we feel like some peop people might be under the cosh. Um, how did you, Emily, mm -hmm. how did you find it? Because this was something that you experienced pretty early on, wasn't it? Yeah, I know we've had a few kind of... Um <laughs> like campaigns against me on <laughs> Twitter, which is fun. I suggest sometimes turning off your DMs if it gets real bad. Um, yeah, no, uh, it's difficult as well because with this job you have to stay on social media to keep up with what's going on. And you can't really be like, okay, I'm getting loads of horrible messages that aren't even kind of like relevant criticism. I can't just kind of turn away from Twitter um, for the time being. Um, I think it's just something that you get used to, unfortunately. Um, I definitely turn to like friends uh, to discuss things and just kind of like vent. I'm like, oh, this is so dumb. Why is this happening? Um, but I don't think it should stop you putting your opinions out there. Um, if anything, it shows kind of how valuable your voice is. If it's something on di diversity, there's currently like the difficulty discussion going on at the moment that I know lots of people are getting uh, some nasty comments <laughs> from. But it's important to have these discussions, and it's, yeah, um, even though it can be quite horrible to get some of this stuff, I, I wouldn't, won't stop doing it. And, yeah, no, I, I'd suggest maybe um, if you're freelancing, trying to kind of create a network with other freelancers so that there, you, people are in the same boat who understand and maybe discussing mm. things with them. I think that's possibly the best way to try and kind of come to terms with it when it happens. Yeah, and, you know, manage your social media use as well. Like, it's, it's impossible, it's almost impossible to do the job without it. But, um, like, it is, there are, you, you do need to learn sometimes that it's, it's, a, it's a workspace and it's a difficult workspace and you need to have a, an area in your life where that workspace isn't. And that means not being on Twitter for a bit, just in the evenings, just when you need a break. 
Um, like, and I would never, if anybody on my team needed to just not be on social media for a while, I would always support that. I know it's difficult sometimes for work, but you have to be able to do that if it's just too difficult a space to be in, I think. Uh, yeah, any other questions? Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks. Um, hi, thanks. Um, so one of the reasons I think I want to get, get into journalism is to try and help push the industry as a whole in a better direction than the problematic behavior that you see. Mm. Um, but what do you think the role is of journalism in helping that push and finding a way to you know, advance the industry in a less aggressive and, you know, I don't know, in, in that sort of like, yeah, toxic. It's, it's, it's it pervades everything that we do. It's, it's really, really, really important. Uh, so it's, it's everything. It's like how we behave ourselves, who we hire. Uh, it's, what, it's what we choose to report on, practice, working practices at game developers. Um, uh, it's in criticism. It's in like making sure that we have like cultural critical angles on games as well as just saying, you know, they're, they're well made. It's just like what do they actually represent? What are they talking about? Um, it's opinion. It's like putting ourselves out there as a website, actually something I think we could, we could be a bit better about at than we are on Eurogamer, just like uh, putting a flag in the ground and saying we stand for this. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's absolutely pervasive and it's not, it's not something that you can duck away from as a journalist. I think you have, to, you have to have opinions on it. You have to think carefully about it as well. You have to make sure that you don't get, you have to be open-minded and make sure that you don't box yourself into your own worldview and not allow other worldviews in, because then you can't, you can't be an effective reporter, I don't think, if you do that. But it is also, like, a, a publication needs to stand for things, and it needs to, uh, you know, it needs to speak to power, and it needs to uh, break down what's happening and, tr and try and, you know, encourage positive change, and I think there's a few times that we've done that. I think if you look at the work that we and other publications are doing about working culture in the games industry at the moment, I think there's really valuable work being done around Red Dead, around Anthem now. Um, but it's, it can be difficult and it can be dispiriting, and like I say, you can, you, you've got to be wary of the echo chamber as well. You don't end up just talking to the people who, you, who agree with you. But that's where something like reporting comes in, because that's not actually about so much about taking a stance. It's about just exploring what is happening and bringing it into the light. And then that can be discussed, and all, you can hear all sorts of different points of view on it. Uh, yeah, do you guys have anything to contribute? Yeah, on that? One, I think increasingly that is the role of games journalism. Um, and I can see it becoming in the next few years the, the, uh, the guiding principle behind most successful websites. Uh, and that is right, that is absolutely the right thing. Um, one of my favourite pieces that you've done, Emma, was uh, an expose on the, uh, on, uh, the toxic community in Team Fortress, oh, yeah. right? Mm. Uh, and this was something I had no idea about. Uh, and when Emma was suggesting it, I thought, that, you know, that's, that's great, it, we should definitely report on that. Uh, it was a brave thing for Emma to report on because you're obviously exposing yourself to a toxic community. <laughs> Um, uh, I, th I, th I felt it was a really great thing to have on the site, it taps into the kind of thing you're talking about. Um, and we got the sense that it affected a change as well, right? Yeah, no, I think a couple of weeks later, like one of the main criticisms I made in the article was because I spoke to a lot of people who were cr like in the workshop community for Team Fortress 2, and they were saying they were getting loads of abuse from uh, kind of small communities and yeah, w within the forums and things like that. And then a few weeks later, uh, Steam introduced changes to how it moderates its kind of community forums, and like maybe it wasn't related, but I'd like it to was. think that yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was. I'd like to think that maybe that had a hand in it and making it easier for um, people to avoid getting that kind of abuse and being able to moderate their own. Yeah. Forums. Now, now, what what more uh, worthy cause could there be than? Reporting on something and affecting change like that, I, I can't, I, I can't think of a more. I was so, you know, proud of that piece when it went live. But I was that just made me even more proud when I heard about uh, it affecting a change. And that that really is what you know, games journalism is should be about now and is moving towards. And if we can contribute to that in any way, 
then I think we're doing doing a good job. So, yeah, I, th I think it's almost the be, be all and end all. You know? It's like certainly guiding principle for me and what we're reporting on mm -hmm. more and more. Um, I feel like I should stress though that we also like, it's all very serious and <laughs> we also <laughs> like to have a laugh, right? Especially on Fridays. And uh, so there's plenty of room in games journalism for more fun features and more like uh, light-hearted looks at aspects of games. Yeah. Asco games can be very funny, mm. uh, they can be, they're inherently entertaining. And so also countering, you know, your, you know, Pulitzer winning stuff, uh, is uh, I love, I know I you know, joked about it, but I do love the Bowsette stuff yeah. as well. <laughs> yes. uh, I, love, I love how you, we can uh, be a place where you can get a different, uh, you know, get so, like, such a variety of, of game mm. journalism. So yeah, it's there a is good point. fun to be had yeah, no, still it's in this industry. It's a good point, and it's something we've lost particularly over the last, what is it, four? four or five years now because it's been such a difficult environment but like video games are entertainment they are fun they're supposed to be and it's important not to lose sight of that so you know make make you know keep playing keep enjoying your, enjoying the games yourselves like that's absolutely absolutely vital that was a, a weird thing for me actually i uh, there was a one stage in my career when i was playing games so professionally i was reviewing a lot and I also felt like a great pressure to play as much as I possibly could outside of that, so I was as fully informed as possible. I just stopped enjoying video games. They became work, and I would want to just put them away and move away from them. And what I did was I took any pressure off myself to be playing games to be relevant. I was like, if I just want to play World of Warcraft, I still play World of Warcraft, then that's fine. If I just want to play Gran Turismo every day, it's not relevant to work, that's fine. If it's something that's relaxing and enjoyable for me, that's great. And that, that, cause that's really important, because that's how normal people play video games. Games journalists play video games usually in a pretty weird way because of our jobs. So it's, it's really important to like, stay in touch with just how you play video games for fun and, and, not, and uh, yeah, not lose sight of that. Uh, sorry, more questions? <laughs> uh, hey, I'm Connor. I'm oh, hi, Connor. Hey, uh, I'm a freelancer, and I was wondering, um, there's kind of like a murky uh, transition period uh, between going from freelancing full-time or part-time or whatever you may be doing it uh, as and getting a full-time position. Yeah. And I was wondering um, how exactly to best go about that because I'm unsure whether or not it's just building a portfolio of work and just getting yourself out there and applying to jobs when they come up just or being proactive and emailing editors and like, what's uh, the best way to make that um, Yes, <laughs> all of the above really. Yeah. Um, I think you're doing a good job, like you're, you're getting work out there, uh, you're doing good articles that are, are getting noticed. It, it takes a bit of time because as you'll have seen on the job market, jobs only come up every so often. There aren't that many people employing people to do this. Um, and there's, there's a lot of competition for them. But if you're out there getting known as a freelancer, fre freelancer building relationships with editors, getting work published on sites with good reputations, uh, then all of that will be helping. No editor is going to mind you getting in touch to say, have you got anything going? Even if the answer is nine times out of ten going to be no. Um, so, because, you know, once in a while it might be yes or it might be no, but then your name's in their head, yeah. like, when a position eventually does come around. So, like, you have to be, you have to be persistent. But if you feel like you're getting someone somewhere as a freelancer, if you're getting work published, if editors say they're liking your work, then you are getting yourself into a good position and then you need to be persistent, you need to be patient. And I know it's hard because freelancing doesn't pay a lot in a lot of cases, but like it's, it's, you know, it's something you need to stick with, I think. Where's you got, well, I'm, I'm, you, you've never done freelancing, have you? So. No, no, yeah, and I'm loath to like, like, but I do commission a lot of features. So I can, I can speak about that as a, uh, um, as a way to get into games journalism. So uh, on when I'm looking for uh, features, it, it is all pretty much exactly the same stuff that I've been talking about. I'm looking for cool stories about games with strong angles, telling me something I didn't know that involves reporting. I'm less interested in the, you know, I, you know, I think Halo's great. Uh, I, I know that already. Lots of people already know that already. So I, I'm so... Um, so when it comes to freelancing and pitching, those kinds of uh, ideas are what we're after, uh, generally. 
And if you want to get into games journalism, that is one of the more uh, useful ways of get improving your profile, uh, establishing a portfolio of writing. Um, it can be, uh, so when regards to internship, I mean, we're looking at uh, sort of unearthing someone from, uh, you know, who, who hasn't already established themselves, who hasn't already made it as, or is making it in a career in games journalism. So it's, if you're interested in an internship, then you, you're sort of treading a fine line there between like, already making it and then or, or being viable for, for the intern scheme. But um, if it were like a, a staff writer job or um, uh, maybe a guides writer job, as a, you know, guides writing is now a huge part of most uh, publications and uh, in terms of hiring is probably where most of it is going on uh, and is uh, a new viable way of getting your foot in the door. Um, then having uh, a, a like links to these articles that I've already had, you know, commissioned and published on these websites is fantastic, right? That will really, really help you. So, um, yeah, I would say keep on doing, specifically to your question, keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, I think you're doing a good job already. So, um, but generally freelancing, the freelancing art, um, getting articles published can only be a good thing if for, wh for when staff writer jobs become available. I'm not going to lie, as Oli said, it's not, they're, they're not a huge amount of like, entry level games journalism jobs. Um, that's where the market is at the moment. Um, all you can do really is try to put yourself in a position where when they do become available, your application will really stand out. I think that's the best thing you can do at the moment. Mm. Uh, any more questions? Should we go to the back, fella at the back? Hey guys, um, so my question sort of stems more to content. So as we've been a press org for a couple of years now and we try very much to sort of spread ourselves over absolutely everything, do you think it's possible to spread yourself too thinly? Do you think we should be focusing more on a particular niche, so to speak? Um, do you, so for example, we do YouTube, we do Twitch as well, but we also then do in written formats news, reviews, that sort of thing. And you also mentioned guides as well, which, which we didn't even think of, so. Um, well, I would say that you, sh you shouldn't try and think of it in terms of like, I'm gonna tackle this genre or something. Um, if you want the written content on your site to stand out now, I think you should be thinking more in terms of stories, right? So you say you do news already, what would be an example of a, new of a news item that you do? I mean, mostly we just sort of report on things like, oh, this game's coming to console next year, or, you know, that particular company is doing this with their console in the, nec in right. the next year or so. At the moment, we're just sort of trying to, to garner a, a following. Yeah, yeah, And it's not necessarily working for us. Yeah, so say. there's a million websites writing that same story, right? Um, so... Uh, it, it's, it's valid to write those stories if you want to offer a comprehensive news service and that's your sort of thing. If you want to be like a destination for all games news, fine. But um, the competition there is ridiculous. It's really hard to stand out if you're essentially uh, rewriting a press release in the same way that all other websites are trying to do. So honestly, uh, what will probably be more effective is taking a bit more time to do uh, to do more original reporting. And, you know, I'm not gonna say you decide to do this and overnight you've doubled your traffic. Uh, it's not gonna work like that. But it will give your content uh, a unique aspect to it. It will give your website a reason to read above other websites. And it will give your, uh, your content a shot on social media because people might go, oh, I didn't know this and share it. Whereas, you know, if they've read that story about that game announcement or release date somewhere else, there's no real reason for them to bother. Uh, there's a, there's uh, an age-old journalism term for this, isn't it? Stories, not subjects. Yeah. Always, always think about that, and that even applies to stuff like reviews. So, like, it does sound like you're trying to do a lot of different things. Maybe you want to slim that down a bit, but I don't think it's so much about thinking we're doing YouTube and we're doing Twitch and we're doing news stories and we're doing guys and we're doing reviews. It's about what are you actually talking about? Are you 
talking about the games that you're passionate about, you're finding stories you really want to tell, you know, and then it will come out of those, you know, that makes sense to do this on YouTube. If you've got a YouTube channel, why not? It makes sense to do this as a stream, makes sense to do this as a, as a written piece. You know, the, the don't, don't, and this is a mis mistake I think we sometimes still make because like Eurogame has been around for 20 years and it has old traditions, but we, we sometimes think about that structure and like, is it, does it go in this pile or this pile of, of the work that we do rather than just like, what, how are we going to talk about this game or this topic? And, you know, put that first, worry about the, the actual form that the story is going to take later, but find the story first or the thing that you care about, the thing you're passionate about, you want to share. Uh, yeah, more questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, other guy in the back row. Hello, uh, I'm Mike Didymus Chu. Um, thanks so much for doing this panel today. It's been really insightful. Um, I'll definitely be sending you some pictures at some point. Um, I've been, been a non-gaming journalist, uh, news journalist for about a decade now, and my experience of the industry, like the hallmark of it, has very much been decline and cuts and um, you know struggles with getting used to the internet and how content works there and keeping numbers up. Mm. switch towards clickbait and all that sort of thing. Um, and I just wondered, in terms of gamer network, like for me, looking at that within the video games industry, that seems to be a place that has avoided that and in fact seems to be growing. You know, there's a new website launched like a couple of days ago from you guys. Yeah. Um, and I just wondered what your thoughts were as to why. Like what is it that you are doing specifically when gaming, within gaming journalism that is working, but that has also meant that you are Overturning that, that it's happening I in mean, wide oh, Why are we awesome? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well I don't know. G games, is a, uh, games is a pretty good industry to be working in. Like, for all the trouble it's got, it's, it's still pretty dynamic. It's still on the up. The audience is still growing. Uh, you know, you still, you've, got, you've got people you know, entering middle age now who aren't giving it up as a pastime and new kids coming in all the time. And, and new forms of gaming coming through all the time. Business is successful. That means there's money around. So, you know, that, that's a good start. Um, in terms of Gamer Network, I think it has helped us a lot that we were an early internet-only company. Obviously, we do events now as well, and that's a huge part of what we do, but, like, we didn't, we didn't have to cope with the transition from print, and I know that's been really difficult for a lot of publishers, and I'm not surprised because the internet is a very different environment, and not only that, it's, it's a, the internet now is a very different environment from what it was 20 years ago when, when Eurogamer was started. But um, I think we've done well. I think there's a few other, there's a few other publishers doing well, and actually Future, uh, which, has, which has been struggling with that transition from print for a long time, is actually in, in reasonably good shape these days. But um, I, think, I think gaming is a good place to be in because the, nat the industry is naturally so dynamic, I think that rubs off on the journalism around it as well. And I think that we, we sort of feel like we have to be dynamic to keep up with the, way, with the way that it's going. We have to change our processes so much because games change so much. Um, and yeah, like I say, that there is money around and that, that definitely helps. Like, what's specifically, again, been good for us is that um, we're a, we're a UK company, we founded on the concept of being a UK company, of creating, like, the, the site's called Eurogamer, it's about not being, it, it was founded to not be a, an American video game site, because that's all there was in 1999. Um, and that means that we developed very strong relationships with the UK gaming industry, and those relationships are behind everything we do, from putting on this event to our direct sales teams going out and, and selling the ads on the website. Which you know has, and the fact that they, those guys have such strong relationships means we're a little bit more insulated from, you know, the difficulty you have just making money off a website as a thing. But that said, like media is changing, it's changing fast. It's, it, it's not. It is a tough environment. We've we've been lucky uh, uh, and skillful, but you know, there's a lot of luck. Um, but it, it's tough. And things are going to have to change. And my belief is that they are going to change and that people are going to have to start paying for journalism on the internet. It's, it's, it's going to be a thing. Just the, last week, you saw Apple 
announce Apple News Plus, which is a broad subscription service it does for like magazines. Now, it's all kind of glossy magazines, and the business model isn't necessarily great, and there's a lot of caveats, but still, it's a major new initiative that is basically pay £10 a month for journalism. And that's like, that's a big change. And I think that's going to be, you know, really important to a lot of publications and something that, that we as a company are probably going to have to look at over the next couple of years. Um, because I don't think the current business model for journalism on the internet is sustainable. Like, working in our little niche in games, we're, we're quite well protected from it, but not completely protected from it. And, and uh, yeah, I, th I think everybody's going to have to do some hard thinking about that. I'm curious, Emma, did you know about Eurogamer before, uh, like, the internship, essentially? Yeah, no, because I did um, a year with uh, Red Brick Gaming, which is the University of Birmingham's like uh, paper and their gaming section. So I already kind of read quite a lot of Eurogamer articles as part of that for research and other things. Uh, but okay. yeah, before that, maybe not so much. I don't know. Right. And what was your impression of the site before you like, interacted um, with it? I think it, it still had it? a really ugly design, so that <laughs> is like <laughs> <laughs> definitely off-putting. Um, yeah, no, I... I I think I said in like my interview for Red Brick Gaming, I was like, I really like Eurogamer's content, but it looks really <laughs> ugly. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I, I think it's good reporting and interesting features. Um, oh gosh, this sounds really like pompous now. <laughs> it's like we're great. No, because um, I'm, I'm curious because <laughs> we, it's hard for us, I think, to know. Mm. Um, you know, to answer that, I think it's hard for us to answer that question because uh, games journalism is so reactive and so fast-paced. It's difficult to step back and sort of understand why things are doing well or why people seem to like what we do. So I'm always interested in what people think of the site before they, you know, get caught in that bubble. Because mm. I think it's, re it's 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 very difficult for us to really understand that. Um, Maybe it's the puns, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's 1999. Mm. Uh, any more questions? Uh, this fellow down here on the my right, on your left. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Will. Um, so I feel that uh, even as this uh, medium of ours is maturing and starting to gain a bit more of a following, people, a lot of people still aren't treating it as seriously as they would other mediums such as uh, film and literature. Um, and so I was just wondering, do you feel that it's, um, as games, journal uh, games journalists, our responsibility to essentially give video games um, the exposure that they need and to essentially do the medium justice uh, sort of in the eyes of everyone? Uh, once upon a time, I would have said yes. Uh, and certainly that's what I used to write for Edge magazine, and that's what that magazine was about in the you know, 90s, 2000s, was about sort of establishing a different tone so, and a really beautifully designed, glossy magazine that would make gaming look professional and adult and uh, cool. Um, I'm, whilst what you say is true, I'm not sure that's kind of where we are at the moment. Gaming is massive. It is necessarily taken seriously. It may not be by a certain subset, and yeah, like most Broadsheet newspapers, for example, don't ascribe the same kind of talent to their to covering games that they do to covering film. But um, they're missing a trick, and you know that's their it's their loss really. And it's I think I think it's our job to, as we were saying earlier, make uh, hold the industry to account and make sure the industry is behaving in a grown-up way, that the culture is behaving in a grown-up, respectable way, and to to encourage that. Um, but I don't think it's our job to try and promote gaming as a as a sort of respectable art form. I think it I think it, it is that, and I think people just have to catch up with that and will catch up with that reality. Um, so I think the important thing is to cover gaming well and to cover it in a mature way. And in a way, I think it's a little bit a little bit uh, defensive to say, oh no, but gaming is is important and is culturally valid. It's, you just have to believe that as a given and move past it and then and cover gaming seriously 
in your own way, and I think that's, what, that's kind of what the industry needs to do to, to move that conversation forward. But I think it's going to happen with time, and you know, as, as people grow older. Like, you know, the deputy leader of the, of the Labour Party, Tom Watson, is an avid gamer. He doesn't have much time for it anymore, but like, that's, that, that shows you the demographic change that we've got, like senior politicians now who aren't just going, what is video games? Some, sounds evil. It's just like it's part of their lives. It's something they, they understand and deal with. And that's, gonna, that's just going to happen over time. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I think it's always embarrassing when you see TV news reports about some new, cool new game development in the games industry. And they always begin with, the games industry is a multi-billion dollar uh, industry that's bigger than film and yeah. books combined. And you're like... Who, who isn't oiling their eyes at that at this stage? You know, it's <laughs> just like, well, yes, we know that. Everyone knows it that. It gets brought up in pretty much like every like mainstream <laughs> article yeah. I see. It's like that one quote, like, oh, yeah, the games industry is bigger than all of the other yeah, ones last year. And you're like, okay, great. Yeah, yeah but that's <laughs> fine, because what you have to understand is if you're, work, uh, like, if you're lucky enough to work on a site like Eurogamer, your story about that topic is probably doing as much traffic as... The Guardians or the BBC story about on that topic. Not if they put it on their homepage, because then you know it might it might go nuts. But like, we we the internet is is a very different publishing space to broadcast or to or to broadsheet journalism. And you have the potential to, if you get the right angle, you get the right story to reach as many people as anybody because you're on the internet and you've, your reach is infinite. So I, I I think looking over your shoulder at what the BBC says is not is not really what we need to be. Doing and moment. to be fair, like what a lot of people still don't really understand things like Fortnite and what's going on with that. You hear it quite well, often. Well, Prince Harry doesn't, does he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, maybe it does still need repeating, but hopefully yeah. it will move past it a little bit more soon. Okay, can we get one more? Yeah, d down here. Because I know you've had your hand up all, all the whole session. Hello. So just to elaborate on an earlier point, with a lot of established names going into crowdfunding, do you think the usual model of ads is feasible anymore? Yeah, it's certainly feasible. Um, crowdfunding is, is different. And I think people who are going into crowdfunding, you can certainly make a great living that way, but it's, uh, it's a different form of publishing because you have a small, passionate audience who are paying you directly and you speak directly to them. And that's your responsibility. Whereas what we do at Eurogamer is we're talking to a very broad audience. And I think it would be like, like crowdfunding can be limiting in, in terms of the, the, the breadth of the audience that you're addressing. It, can be, it, it really depends what, you're, what you want to do. And for someone like Chris Bratt, who used to work with us, he had a very specific idea in mind. He knew there would be people out there who wanted to see it. Uh, enough of them who wanted to pay for it so that he could do it professionally. But like, I think, I think there needs to be a new middle ground between purely ad-supported and between uh, small-scale kind of crowd-funded Patreon type stuff. There needs to, we need to actually just start doing subscription-based paid journalism in a broad sense on the internet. I think that's, that's really important, but that's like a, that's a big media topic. As for like whether you should go to Patreon, like, I think it's hard to do it without uh, building a name for yourself first, and you find a lot of the most successful patrons are people who've already worked for big media organisations before, and have built their names up that way. So I'm not, I wouldn't recommend it necessarily as a way to get into games journalism unless you have like an absolutely killer idea that nobody else is doing. Uh, but with that, we should wind it up because Jonty's looking at me very seriously. So yeah. uh, <laughs> thank um, you very much for coming. If people do have questions about the internship after, just come like grab me, and I'll have a little chat with you guys. So yeah. Cool. Uh, All right. So Thank you. Oh yeah. Please apply. <laughs>